Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to our spring webinar and meeting. My name is Christy Mortar and I work with Hennepin County in the Transportation Operations Department. And I'm also the chair for the Infrastructure Research Council. Um, just before we get started, I will be um, helping to facilitate today's webinar and which is sponsored by CTS, a little bit about the councils. Um, the CTS council does provide a forum for transportation professionals and researchers to share information on current transportation issues and trends. They bring together university faculty and staff with practitioners from the public and private sectors to recommend direction, participate in improving the center's research, education, and engagement programs. I would also like to share that Gina Boss and Rachel Berdur from CTS are with us today helping support the, the event and webinar. And I'd like to thank them for helping us make this happen. Um, shortly, Gina will share a link to the council information in the chat. So today's webinar is gonna feature a presentation on the new tools for informed decisions and pavement management. I will share a little bit more about this in a moment, but first I'd like to turn it over to our council vice chair, Beth Ingham, who is co-facilitating this webinar today. Thanks, Christy. I'm Beth Ingham. I am a senior project manager with Bolton and Mank, a consulting firm here in the state of Minnesota. And we're looking forward to you guys participating today in our presentation. We're going to have you put any questions you have, either in the chat or in the Q&A um, function there at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will definitely read those there after the presentation. If you'd rather raise your hand, you can use the raise hand function and we'll unmute you so that we can hear your um, question verbally. So we are um, able to provide credits today for continuing education. Um, so to professional development hours, two of them, um, two hours also for um, AICP uh, maintenance credits. And the PDH form is going to be uploaded in the chat in case you need it. So CTS will be having an all councils meeting coming up that we'd like to make you aware of because all are welcome. And this year we're gonna do a hybrid format. Um, held both virtually and at the McNamara Alumni Center on the U of M campus. And that event is on May 9th, so not too far around the corner. And the topic is going to be bending the curve, addressing troubling trends in Minnesota's traffic fatalities. So you can attend in person um, or via Zoom, and we need you to register if you're interested. And again, it's, it's free and, and anyone is welcome to join us. And finally, uh, before I turn it back over to Christy, if you're a student today joining, we want you to send a chat to all of our panelists with your name because we track um, students who are engaged in our uh, webinars. And thank you. Turn back over to Christy. Thank you, Beth. Um, so I'll just start by giving a brief description of our webinar. So today's presentation will highlight new tools developed to help planners and policymakers make more informed decisions about investments in pavement assets, and then to accurately predict pavement condition over time. So we're going to hear from some U of M researchers, as well as um, some staff at MnDOT with some examples on how they're using and impl implementing these tools as well. So I'm pleased to welcome today's speakers. Uh, we've got Mihai Marastano, um, who is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the University of Minnesota. And then from the, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, we've got three speakers today. Um, Jennifer Asp, she's a pavement management analyst with MnDOT. Glenn Engstrom, um, he's the director of the Office of Materials and Road Research. And then Dave Solzrud, um, who is the Asset Management Program Manager. So Mihai, I'll turn it over to you and you can start, start us off. See the screen and hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you for for the opportunity to present uh, our 
research that uh, we just uh, finalized a few weeks ago, a few months ago, um, and the title is New Tools for Informed Decisions in Data Management. And um, of course, I would like to acknowledge, oops, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, it's changing by itself so much. <laughs> I have to see if I can keep it. And uh, uh, so myself and uh, Jennifer, who was our uh, graduate student, uh, and uh, who defended actually her PhD thesis from this uh, research, uh, very interesting research. And then, of course, uh, Glenn Engstrom, who was a champion for the project and uh, provided uh, uh, great support to, to the research team. And, uh, uh, they told them to provide a lot of very beneficial input in this uh, research effort. Before I do that, uh, basically what we are going to present today is um, a summary of the, oh, hold on a second, I have to change this to this format. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that, so at least now I think this is not going to happen. <laughs> so, just give me one second. Me, Mihai, this is Gina. Could you speak closer to the uh, the microphone, it's, a couple people are having trouble hearing you. Yes, I had this problem and I cannot figure out why. <laughs> does it does this sound better? Yes, that sounds better when you, yes. Okay, so, and um, basically what um, we're doing today is provide a summary of a research project that as I mentioned, we finalized recently. Uh, it is called Remaining Service Light Asset Measure Phase 2. And I would like to acknowledge the, uh, my co authors. Uh, so, Jennifer, we will present today, and uh, then my colleagues, Professor Ali, Ali Reza Khani, uh, who was responsible for um, optimization part and part of the Markov analysis, and uh, of course, Professor Gary Davis who provided a lot of uh, input and uh, ideas for the Markov analysis. Uh, so that being said, so this report is available. There is a lot of details that we cannot cover today, but this is available online. So it's uh, the research report uh, 02 from, oh, I forgot the name. Yeah, there is a, a number here. All right. So uh, with that, let's move on and give you a little bit of background. So this work actually started uh, maybe three, four years ago. We had a phase one of the remaining service life project. Uh, it was championed by uh, uh, Glenn, who wanted to see if there are other uh, metrics that can be used to better uh, characterize what's going on with the condition of uh, the pavement network. And of course, we started to look at, uh, you know, the current parameters. And for example, I'm sure most of the people know that MinDOT has used the remaining service life, the RSL, uh, as a measure for, uh, for pavement condition for more than a decade. Uh, RSL is an estimation of the time until the next major rehabilitation occurs for a pavement section and the, the rehabilitation is triggered by an RQI of 2.5, at which time uh, the, the pavement is said to have uh, zero life. And uh, the RSL is simply calculated as the difference between the predicted and uh, time when this happens and the present time. Uh, however, you know, there have been many discussions if uh, this simple parameter can give us a true understanding of the condition of the system. And in addition to that, there were no costs associated with uh, various conditions, various distribution of the remaining service life of the network. Uh, so what we did, we basically uh, performed a very thorough investigation in phase one, looking at what else it's there, what other people uh, are using or are in the process of using. And we found out that 
there are a few more parameters that are uh, that people have used, uh, and also from the very beginning, we are interested to see if we can actually uh, provide a probabilistic approach to uh, what's happening in the PayPal network because there are so many obviously variables that uh, affect uh, the results. So at the end of phase one, we recommended uh, three parameters for a further investigation, and I'll mention them in a second. And also we recommended that we try and do a probabilistic rather than deterministic analysis that would also allow us to perform an optimization, um, uh, some optimization to determine what is the best way to uh, uh, basically schedule activities, repair activities, and what kind of activities we want to, to have. Uh, and uh, the three parameters that we investigated further were the percent remaining service life interval, which this is very easily calculated from the remaining service life. Uh, you see here that we added interval because there was a concern that maybe people hear about so the, the end of service life, they think that the pavement is gone. So maybe it's better to put a service interval uh, rather than uh, uh, just life. And also to uh, normalize different pavements that have different uh, uh, design lives, you know, you can have 20, 30 years. We wanted to normalize and so we can report everything uh, using the same units as a percent remaining service life. So this is not very different than the RSL is just presented in a, in a different format. However, the other two parameters were different. Uh, so there were additional parameters that um, uh, we used, these additional metrics. The first one is called asset sustainability ratio. And this basically measures the annual sustainability of investments in pavement asset protection. So it's a, a sustainability parameter. And also another parameter called deferred preservation liability that basically is an estimate of funding that is necessary to address you know, the delays in deferred payment rehabilitation. And these two last parameters, uh, we, uh, we investigated them based on some uh, uh, research that was done at the uh, Washington State Department of Transportation that they have been uh, using these two additional metrics for quite some time with good results. And that's why we wanted to adopt it for, uh, for our network. Uh, the, basically the main idea, the goal was to try and uh, use these parameters to, and plus the, the, the probabilistic analysis to see how we can get the pavement network to a stable configuration, uh, which allows for more consistent planning. So if you look at what's going on, MinDOT is doing a, a great job, you know, meeting all their goals in terms of how many pavements are in good and very good condition and uh, limiting the, uh, the number of miles in poor condition. However, is this idea of what happens if, you know, at some point after a number of years, we end up with a lot of pavements that have to be repaired at the same time. So, so basically what we are trying to do is to provide tools to eliminate that kind of situation, to prevent that from happening and uh, basically uh, achieve a stable condition in which funding uh, to bring the system to a, a good condition and then funding basically stays the same. So you fix uh, the same number or relatively same number of pavements every year and uh, that keeps uh, you know the network in, in good or very good shape. So that was more for, for planning purposes. Okay, so you know, we looked at the data that is collected by, by MinDOT. I, I'll, I don't have a, a lot of time, so I'll go through this very quickly. Of course, you know, uh, our DOT collects the pavement condition data every year. Uh, they have these sophisticated bands. Now they have uh, the road doctor that brings in even more uh, information and they collect pavement roughness, rutting, faulting, cracking, and other, other distresses. 
and the data is then used to uh, calculate a number of uh, payphone condition indices, um, uh, such as ride quality index, surface rating, and so on, and from uh, RQI, remaining service life, and also uh, international roughness index that everybody's uh, measuring. So, um, and this is an example of an RQI for people who are not familiar. Uh, of, uh, so it goes from zero to five, very good uh, between four and five, good three to four and so on. And then four uh, is uh, one and uh, below, I mean, two and below. And this shows uh, a pavement in uh, good condition, uh, RQI between three and four. And this is one that definitely needs some repair. So, um, and that's uh, just uh, uh, an example. And also just wanted to mention, uh, maybe not a lot of people know that there is a direct correlation between RQI and IRI. Uh, and uh, uh, this can be interrelated and they are different for bituminous pavements and concrete pavements. So, uh, which it's very good because that tells us that RQI, although is done through uh, you know, volunteers who drive on top of our pavements and come up with this rating, uh, this is uh, an objective type of measurements because it, it is re directly related to uh, uh, to the IRI, which is uh, a, a, a property uh, that is uh, not subjective. It's an objective property measured with specialized equipment. All right, so we looked at all the data. We had access to um, uh, the Office of Material and Raw Research. They are extremely helpful, provided all the data. I forgot to mention um, Dave Janish, who uh, provided a lot of uh, information and uh, also helped us with uh, some, some of the issues we had with the data uh, and uh, his help was invaluable. Uh, but bottom line is for our analysis, we, uh, for our uh, probabilistic analysis that Jennifer will discuss, we looked at what data is available and we found out that uh, the only one that we could use that would allow us to perform a robust analysis was bituminous over bituminous. Uh, uh, most of the pavements, the vast majority of pavements are in this category, while some of the other pavements did not, we did not have enough data to be able to perform uh, this more complex analysis. Okay. Uh, what am I doing here? Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to show you some examples. So this is the percent remaining service interval. As I mentioned, it is not that different compared to remaining service life. It just expresses a percentage. And this shows uh, a distribution of this parameter calculated in 2018 on the a vertical axis is the percent of sections that are uh, that have this remaining service interval. So quite a few are, you know, zero and five remaining service intervals. So that will need to be fixed. And we also have uh, a number of pavements that are almost brand new. So, so that gives you an, uh, an interesting uh, distribution of uh, uh, how many pavements are going to be repaired uh, in, uh, in the coming years. Now, in terms of asset sustainability ratio, this was introduced by uh, Washington State Department of Transportation in 2012 to measure what they call the annual sustainability of investments and quantify uh, how pavement replenishment is keeping with pavement wear, basically. It's, and it can be calculated by dividing annual replay, replenishment, how many payphones are fixed over how many are not fixed annual consumption. And uh, uh, while we are working on, on this project, we found out that actually MinDOT was one step ahead of us and they have already implemented some calculations. They were a little bit different than what the uh, uh, Washington Department of Transportation uh, did, but and this is explained uh, in, uh, in the report but uh, approximately the calculations are the same. So the annual replenishment, the replenishment is calculated as a summation of average life added to the network with each rehabilitation activity that is performed. And uh, 
from we obtain this uh, table from Dave Janish, and basically you can see each activity adds this number of uh, years. So this is the added life. So basically, all you have to do is look at number of miles that have received this type of activity, and then multiply each individual um, pavement that received this activity with the added life. Sum it up, and then you obtain. Uh, the annual replenishment for so for a given year we multiply the length of each segment getting one of the fixes uh, uh, that I showed before by the added life the sum of all of these fixed pavements added life represent the annual replenishment for the consumption the total length of mean dot pavement network that did not receive any repair was used and this number is multiplied by one, which basically represents the early decrease in remaining service life. So obviously they were not fixed. So they, then next year, they will be one year older, so less remaining service life. And the asset sustainability ratio is basically the ratio of the two values. And we've done some calculations uh, and uh, based on the information that uh, Mindot provided, and these are the numbers and the added life that you can see here. And so a very simple calculation. So this was the annual replenishment for 2017. And uh, uh, that's how this was done. And there are examples in the report. So this gives you an idea of, uh, I don't think I have a slide here. I should have had a slide with a number. So if you are, this ratio is uh, close to one, that means that you basically replenish uh, the same amount that you consume. So in a stable system that uh, this ratio should be closer to one. If I remember correctly in uh, some of the calculations, uh, I think MinDOT was close to, to one. Uh, the other uh, parameter that, we explored was the, what is called a deferred preservation liability. And in this case, we are looking at costs, something that we haven't done with the previous parameters. So basically this estimates the funding required to address the cumulative backlog of deferred payment rehabilitation. Uh, the, the idea when uh, Wisconsin, excuse me, Washington Department of Transportation implemented it was to take into account the higher cost of rehabilitation as pavement condition gets worse and more extensive repairs are needed and provides a cost estimate for the amount of preservation backlog carried by the system. So as you probably know, uh, Washington Department of Transportation, they have a very aggressive pavement preservation system and this was a tool that they used to show actually uh, the, the benefits of such an approach. And uh, we performed um, similar calculations with quite what they did. These are um, the length in miles of sections that had uh, uh, zero remaining service life for at least two years. This is the uh, criterion that was used by uh, Washington Department of Transportation. So they looked at all their pavements that had zero for at least RSL for at least two years, and we determined uh, these miles. These are per district, and uh, this is a plot of the data. So the length of sections with uh, zero RSL for two or more years, and you can see an increase in the 2008, 2009, 2010, and maybe some people can relate that with some funding decisions that were made in our state at that time. And uh, however, in the last years, it has decreased, which is a, a good sign. And then of course, we can associate some costs with that. We used some values that were given to us by the materials office. Uh, we used the um, uh, uh, medium mill and overlay, a uh, medium mill and overlay uh, that adds 15 years of life uh, we, uh, we assume the cost of uh, $277,000 per lane mile. Uh, and for the thicker overlays, uh, 17 years of improvement, 387. And basically we multiplied this cost with the length of the due sections. And that's how we calculated uh, the deferred preservation liability for a number of years. 
as I mentioned, you could see that the number was really very high, 2008, 9, and now there is a trend of going down, which is um, uh, very encouraging. And this is a plot of the deferred preservation liability, as I mentioned. I think this concludes my presentation with the uh, three parameters. Uh, if there are questions, we can address them at the end. But I think the more interesting part uh, is uh, what Jennifer will present because this is quite unique and uh, has not been done before. Uh, to our knowledge, it required quite a lot of <laughs> work, to be honest. And uh, but I think the results are very encouraging. So thank you. Thank you, Mihai. Um, let me share my screen. So I'll be talking about the second half of our project. Um, I believe you can see my slides. Yes, we can yes. see. Okay, is this, is it the right, is it the full screen format? Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. Sorry, that looked different this time than last time. Um, okay, thank you. So um, yeah, I'll be talking about the second half of our project and um, where we use the data from MnDOT to develop a Markov chain model. And the current challenge in payment management is predicting the payment performance and iteration. And this prediction is essential in payment management because it provides information that allows for forecasting repair demanding demands and optimizing life cycle costs. Based on this need, many prediction models have been developed. Uh, they're mostly deterministic, but as Mihai said, we're looking for a stochastic model, such as the Markov chain, which is the one that we developed. Um, okay, so the basic idea behind using Markov chain in payment management is that first, the payment condition can be characterized using a finite number of districts, discrete states. So if you look at this figure I have at the bottom, we have five states here, and each of those states represent the condition of the payment. So one state being the best condition and five being the worst one. And that brings us to our second point here that the deterioration can be approximated by transitioning from one state to the next one. So if the payment is in state one, every duty cycle or every year, there's a probability that that payment will either remain in the state one, and there's a probability that it could transition into the next state and that transitioning represents the decay process. And last, the trans transition between states is influenced only by the current state of the payment. This is a requirement from the Markov chain process that every state should hold all the information that's needed to know what's happening next. Um, uh, the Markov models require the form formulation of a transition matrix. So for this, it's simple. I'm showing with five states. Uh, those, this will give us a five by five transition matrix with the probabilities uh, shown in there. Now, our next step in our project was to determine our Markov states. So we have 17 states. Initially, we had five, as I showed in it's simple. Um, but we ended up with 17. And the reason for that was that the time that the sections spend in each condition state, we call that lifetimes. Um, once we had uh, five states, those lifetimes, they, were, they had a Poisson distribution. Now, a Poisson distribution characterizes semi-Markov behavior, while a Markov behavior is characterized by a geometric distribution. So the semi-Markov model wasn't in our scope of a project. So in order to remain in the Markovian behavior, our strategy was to refine the states um, to get a different distribution. And this, that's how we define those RQI bounds um, for each of our condition state. Here in this figure, the first plot shows the distribution for, of lifetime for a state number two. So this is the time that the pavement sections spend in state two in years. And the second plot shows the predicted geometric distribution for this data set. 
we can overlap them and see that now they're approximate. So we conclude that for this um, state configuration, the pavement has an exponential dec decay characteristic of a geometric distribution, which implies now a Markovian behavior. Um, after many trials, we got uh, good bounds for every each one of our 17 states. Um, and we got all, the, all of them to be approximately geometric, geometrically distributed. And that um, shows we have a Markovian behavior now. So this is how we have 17 states. Also, uh, Miha explained about RQI, Red Quality Index. And once the pavement reaches 2.5 RQI, it's attributed zero remaining service life. And that pavement is believed to be in need of major repair or reconstruction. And once it drops to 2.0, it's in poor condition. So pavement sections shouldn't really be in a condition below two for long. If they do, it's usually abnormal cases. So we decided not to include those in our analysis. And that's how we determined our cutoff point to be 2.0. So this is why our state 17 goes into 2.0. So now we have uh, this model configuration for, and we have our 17 states. And if a pavement section is in state one, every year there is a probability it would move, it would remain in state one or it could transition into any of the next states. And if it's in state two, the same thing. So now we have a more complex model and that gives us the, instead of a five by five, now we have a 17 by 17 um transition probability matrix and this one we filled it with um the transition prob transition probabilities we used the maximum likelihood method which is basically we looked at the historical data that MinDOT has and we used the proportions of pavement that remain in the same state or transition into the next state every year and this is how we computed these probabilities um, now, at this point, a concern was raised by MinDOT regarding the possibility that external factors were influencing the pavement deterioration. So to address that, we propose an enhancement of this transition matrix, um, just so the pr probabilities were functions of those external factors. Our first step was to investigate which of those, what kind of factors could be relevant and based on what data we had available, we selected six of them. First was a district. So MnDOT has eight districts as shown in this figure. Um, so we consider that location to be one of our factors. Next was the last activity that was performed. As Mihai said, we're using bituminous over bituminous pavement, which means that all those pavements, at some point, they started as bituminous of aggregate base, and at some point, they received major repair, and they became bituminous of bituminous. So we, they all have a repair history, and we wanted to um, include that in our analysis. Also, due to data limitations, we were able to include traffic, but our strategy was to use functional class and speed limit because they reflect traffic. And... We also included the thickness of base and the thickness of the surface. Um, we chose ordinal logistic regression model. Um, and the reason for that was that pavement deterioration has a certain order and it also has multiple response levels. And by, by that, I mean, it has an order because uh, pavement starts in condition one and it decays in an order process. And it has multiple response levels because if we look at state four that I have highlighted here in this table, um, every year it can remain in state four or it can transition to any of the next ones. So those errors with zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, those are multiple response levels. So ordinal logistic regression was a model able to accommodate those characteristics. Um, for each state, for each condition state, we had its own data set and we developed a model for every state. And here I have an example. This is for state four. I have this table showing my model coefficients. Um, we, can see, we started with those six external factors, site-specific features, and we selected for, 
for each state, we selected the ones that were statistically significant. So this is in, my, in this table, I show my lean model with the statistically significant factors. And once I had the lean model, we tested its goodness of fit. We used the hosmer lemichev test, which is a test used to, for uh, ordinal logistic regression models. And our null hypothesis was that the model results in a good fit for the data. And our alternative hypothesis that the fit for the model was poor. At a 5% significance level, we failed to reject the null hypothesis, which means that the test could not find any problems with our model. And there was uh, in, in, as in how it was fitting the data. So the, the model was approved um, and we found that it was fitting the data satisfactory. Once we tested the model, we used those coefficients I showed to develop um, the transition probabilities. This equation shows, this is a ordinal logistic regression equation. And now instead of having integers as our probabilities, in our transition matrix, we have ordinal logistic uh, regression equations when the variables are those external factors that were found to be statistically significant. With that data set for state four, we filled out the fourth line of our transition matrix. Um, here is just showing the equations in that line. And we repeated that process for all our other states of developing a model, testing its goodness of fit, deriving the equations for the transition probabilities and then filling in in the transition matrix. So now we have a 17 by 17 matrix and the probabilities are now functions of those external factors. And now this matrix with these equations, it can be used to derive site-specific transition probabilities for any payment section, which is a big advancement. It hasn't been possible in the past with Markov chains. And this was a big accomplishment of this project. And now I'll show some applications of it. It can be, first it can be used to forecast pavement deterioration. And to show an example, we selected a group of a hundred pavement sections with the following characteristics. So we need to know um, which district those sections are located and what kind of repair history they have and so on. So we can generate the site-specific transition matrix. Um, and here is a demonstration. So we initially, those sections were all in state condition three. They had an RQI of 3.9. And using the Markov properties, we were able to forecast the decay of those 100 sections. So that front line, the maroon color, we have all the 100 sections in state three. And then the second line in the yellow, we can see part of them remained in state three, part of them deteriorated into the next state. Some of them went to five and six. Um, and so we can see after a year, after two years, and that orange line in the back shows the distribution after five years, how those sections are expected to um, be. And we can go even further and, and forecast that distribution after 10, 15, and 20 years. And it, we can see that after 20 years, most of the pavement sections are expected to be in the worst possible uh, condition because they are being fixed. Um, now, another application, we can, we can use the method to analyze how each of those site-specific features are affecting the payment performance. Um, so to do that, first we're gonna look at district. So we got another group of 100 payment sections. We had all the characteristics to be the same as the first group, except the district. So the first sections were in district number two, and these ones are in district number seven. We repeated or analysis, and then we did a side-by-side -side comparison. So here we can see um, after one year, that same pavement section, if it's located in district number seven, it's expected to decay faster than if it's located in district number two. And we can look at that progression over time for five, 10, 15 years, 20 years here. Um, and we can even look at all the districts together. And this one, this figure is a little busy, but we can see, all the eight districts. And we can see, for example, that this red color, district number one, for the same pavement, the same type of pavement, 
it will be expected to decay faster if it's located in district number one than it's, if it's located in district um, five or two in this case. And this method can be used to analyze not only districts, but any of those site-specific features. Here's another example. We have the repair history. So for the same payment, for the same type of payment, um, if it has last received a Nova chip, which is an ultra thin overlay, um, it's expected to decay faster than it had than if it has received a thin overlay. And then if it was if that last repair was a thick Milan overlay, then it would decay the slowest. Um, last, I'll talk about how those transition probabilities that we generated can be used to optimize the sequence of uh, payment repairs. For that, we developed a Markov decision process. The Markov decision process is a mathematical framework used for modeling any multi-criteria decision-making. Um, it has four main elements, first states, then actions, transition probabilities, and rewards. We already have our states, those 17 states. So now we, uh, we need to determine which, what our actions will be. So for any pavement section every year, we have the option of doing nothing. We can just wait until the next year. Or if we do decide to do something, we have several repair activities that can be done to that pavement section. And here for this, for the sake of illustration, we selected three repair activities. So our first action is do nothing, just wait. And then our three next section, sec, our three next actions are uh, those three repair activities that we selected to show the capability of the model. And so we have states, we have actions, now we need the transition probabilities. And each action requires its own transition probabilities. The probabilities for doing nothing is simply that decay matrix that we developed before or no logistic regression. So we already have that. And then if we choose actions two, three, and four, um, we need to combine the decay probabilities with the recovery effect that's observed after each of those um, repairs were performed. So here I have an example from historical data that MnDOT has, we were able to compute um, this recovery effect of the repair activities. Here I show, here we show the effect of repair for thin Milan overlays. So after thin Milan overlays performed, these are the probabilities that this section of how this section is expected to recover. Um, now that we have states, actions, transition probabilities, we just need the rewards. And the rewards are basically the combination of how much we have to pay for a repair, what cost it would generate versus what improvement will be observed after we perform that repair. Now, those two, um, those two factors had different units because, you know, costs is in dollar amount and the improvement is in RQI. And RQI goes from five to zero. So it was hard to, to put them together. So we propose a monetary conversion factor for RQI improvement, which basically it's, how many, how, in dollar amount, what is the quantity that quantifies uh, the improvement of RQI? Um, so once we, we had that, we had those two in comparable units. So for cost, uh, we got the cost information from uh, MnDOT's uh, database program, HPMA. Um, these are the expected costs for each of those repairs. And then for the benefit, we used our monetary conversion factor that we proposed multiplied by the RQI improvement that we observed after each of those repair activities were performed. So now that we have our four elements of our Markov decision process, we're able to compute the optimal policy. We use the Bellman equation, um, which I show here in this S equation. This is our um, action value equation. And the optimal policy is defined by selecting the sequence of repair activities that would give us the highest um, action value function, the, the highest value for this uh, function here. Um, just a brief example. 
uh, we selected uh, for this specific pavement with these specific uh, characteristics, considering those four possible actions. And we're looking at the next 10 year, a 10 year horizon for our Markov decision process. We found that for this specific pavement section, when we have those four possible actions, the best optimal um, um, action is to not do anything for the first, um, if until it reaches a state condition nine, and then once it reaches a state condition nine, the most cost-effective um, action is to do a thin overlay. So in summary, uh, our project is started by providing an overview of MnDOT's payment management program. So we describe the data acquisition process, the prediction model, and the optimization methodology. And we also use that data to compute those three parameters. And I talked about the percent remaining service life, asset sustainability ratio, and deferred preservation liability. We also developed a Markov transition matrix and enhanced it with ordinal logistic regression models. We demonstrate how it can be used to predict payment performance and to analyze specific um, site-specific features and also how it can be used in a optimization uh, process. The advantages of our proposed uh, ordinal logistic reg regression models and mark of chain matrix is that it allows us to look into a specific, uh, how specific factors affect the performance of the pavement. And it also allowed for um, site-specific features, which is a, it wasn't possible with Markov until this point. And recommendations for future, uh, we recommend adding additional activities to the Markov decision process. As I said, this was an illustration. So we only used um, three repairs and repair activities in our actions. Uh, so including more activities would give them a, a better idea of uh, a payment network, uh, especially inc including reconstruction or preventive maintenance. Also, um, additional site-specific factors can be added. We had some limitations of data, so we could include traffic. Um, so including more of those could also give a more complete picture. And last, there are different versions of the Markov decision process, and they can be used depending on the objective. So we used a finite horizon for 10, the 10 um, next years, but there are also different versions. So if the goal is to have um, a consistent funding every year or a consistent uh, repair, pavement distribution, um, there are different options for Markov decision process that can be used in those cases. And with that, I think I'll pass it to Glenn. Thank you, Jennifer. Hopefully you can hear me fine. Yeah. I think I have someone that's going to run the slides for me. I've already had a couple of glitches today. <laughs> I thought this would work better at the office, but that didn't turn out very well. So, so thanks. And thanks for Jennifer and, and Mihai for their work. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm Glenn Inks from the Office Director of MnDOT's Materials and Road Research. I work with about 125 wonderful people, including Jennifer now, so it's great. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're trying to use all this information and what we call our payment investment evaluator. That's a picture of the lab uh, a year and a half ago when there were fewer people there and uh, we decided to chip seal our parking lot given, given that situation. So next slide, please. Thank you. So we've got some legislation related to payments that uh, industry has been very active recently in pushing through legislation related to how we select payments. So the latest last year was we will develop this payment investment guide, which we called it at the time. And we also the commissioner also review and approve all payment selections uh, throughout the state. This was uh, 
not something we we ask for, but we have been developing this guide for many years, and it's it's taken us quite a while. Unfortunately, one thing I did, which I'll never do again, never, never, my advice for today is never promise when software is going to be delivered, especially new software. It's a, it's a difficult, long process. Next, next uh, slide, please. So it used to be the pig. It's not the pig anymore. It's now the, the pie, the pig with investment evaluator. Two years ago, it's me and my brother. When we had the pig, we haven't had the pig for a while, unfortunately. Next slide. Okay, so MnDOT has a large system, obviously cities and counties do too. I just wanna show this to tell people how complex uh, our pavement system is and how complex it is to select the optimum projects throughout every year. So you can see there, we're, we're close to 12,000 center line miles close to 30,000 lane miles. But I think what's critical here is we, we pretty much need to touch about 700 miles each year to keep up with normal deterioration. It's, it's, it's very, very critical that we do that. It's a, it's a process that's, again, is, is complicated. And we, uh, to go to the next slide, we spend approximately, 300 million each year just on pavements. It's a, it's a large budget, obviously, and it's distributed uh, by need and formula to each district. That picture there is a picture of District 3, which is Brainerd Baxter area, Central Minnesota District. So the districts must meet our performance targets, and there are many fix options for hot mix, you know, close to you know 13 options. Concrete, we got 11. So you can imagine you got all these rules to fix. You got all these options and they're all on different subgrades, base materials. They've got different traffic, et cetera, et cetera. It, it gets quite complex pretty quickly. Next slide. So we, we have, we're in the middle of, we're almost complete with our payment investment evaluator. And essentially it's a piece of software that will aid the districts in the selection of their payment type fixes for our STIP, which is our four-year program, and our CHIP, which is our 10-year program. That's a picture of, uh, I think that's I-90 down in District 6, a concrete job. Next slide. So what, what is this uh, payment? What is the pie? Pi really is it's software that enables districts again to more easily run a mix of fixed scenarios. Our existing software doesn't allow that at all. It's not user friendly. It takes time. And uh, we really want to have the districts run it because they're the best people to decide what fixes they need to do in their districts based upon all their needs and all the things going on in the district with the uh, Payments and associated bridge projects, because we try to package projects, obviously, to uh, eliminate issues with uh, the traveling public. So again, it'll, uh, the user could vary the percentages of long-term, medium, short fixes, including preventive maintenance, all those different types I showed you before. They could vary those and then hit the button and out come these new health indicators, we're calling them. And I'll talk about that next but also will allow the districts and any user to be intentional. Let's say they wanna do a lot of long-term fixes or more to, to try to uh, improve the, the program long-term. It also will allow them to look at, let's say there's an influx of money for whatever reason, like we recently have, how do you best use that? So again, it's a, it's a modeling program to enable the user to uh, select the optimum, I use that a little loosely here, optimum fixes for their area. That picture there is, uh, I don't know if CAT has that facility anymore, up in Brooklyn Park where they build pavers and they build rollers and have a showroom that was a couple of our engineers during an NWRA meeting were crawling around on those, it was kind of fun. Next slide. So, 
currently we pretty much everything is looked at based upon these performance goals of percent poor and percent good and these are based on ride and those are our targets there each system has a different target whether it's interstate uh, the rest of the national highway system or our non uh, nhs roads and you can see the percents vary based on, pretty much based on uh, traffic to a certain extent that's where those numbers were developed next slide Did I go so too far, Glenn? Sorry. No, I think that's the next one. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you. So uh, we've, we've created these new high performance indices, health indicators, whatever you want to call them. We're trying to get past that, that star there, which is based on condition only. Uh, I think you'll see that these are, uh, give us a better insight, I think, into how we're spending our money. So I, I, the one, the couple of them I really like are the back, backlog, meaning how many miles of road aren't we able to fix based upon the money we have. And again, all this is based upon the budget. The budget does not change when we run these investment scenarios. The other one I like is the asset sustainability ratio basically tells you, uh, are you keeping up with normal deterioration? Uh, another one I think is, is good is uh, uh, above, the, above the backlog one is the condition. How many vehicle miles traveled are we having on good roads, fair roads and poor roads? Could, the previous, our normal indices we use now, condition of, miles in good form pair, they don't look at how many people are affected. And I think that's what's good about this new measure. We're also looking at cost per lane mile per ESO, cost per lane mile period, asset valuation, uh, bringing service life range. There's a, there's a lot of indices there that we basically have borrowed from other states. We think these really have some applicability to what we're trying to accomplish here. Somebody said once, maybe we didn't see a measure we didn't like. And at the early stages of using this program, that's pretty much where we're at. We'll see how they work out as we get into using the, the pie. Next uh, slide, please. So again, a little bit more detail about each one. Asset sustainability ratio, basically, how much are you putting in? to the system, how much value are you adding? And then every year, of course, every road gets a year older. So that's that's how much you, you lose in the normal deterioration. I really like, again, the cost per lane mile per ESL. Are, are, we, are we maximizing the benefit to the public? Now that, this measure obviously could cause some issues with some of our lower volume roads, you know, the typical farm to market road versus the interstate. But I still think this will help us uh, help us look at how we're spending our money. And again, the last one, uh, percent miles traveled on poor and good roads. Are we providing smooth roads to the maximum number of travelers? That, that measure is actually used oh, in New York State. I think a couple of New England states are using that measure. I, I think these are powerful tools we can show to people how, you know, how we're spending our money. Next slide. So where are we? Uh, that picture is actually in front of my house. They were doing an FDR job, full depth recycling. I think what's cool about that is it's something we've been working on for years at MnDOT. And it was really, really good to see it, uh, you know, filtering down to levels of low volume roads like the one in front of my house. That's like maybe a hundred cars a day at the most, maybe less. So where are we at with the, with the status of the pie? Uh, data version is complete. Uh, people like Jennifer are trying to use it as is, but we're, we're getting a new consultant and they'll be on board within the month. And we wanna get that done by uh, February, like it says there. We hired a new person and that person is Jennifer. 
Uh, we've had meetings with our district materials engineers on this. There's a lot of interest in this planning tool, obviously, given the, given the legislation I talked about earlier. And we've also had meetings with our statewide planners, our district engineers, uh, pre-construction managers group, a, a, lot of, a lot of discussion on this. We're also creating new MnDOT policy related to this. It talks about the process itself. What's that gonna look like? Commissioner approval, how that's gonna be delegated. Obviously the commissioner is not terribly interested in approving, approving every project out there, but so we're working on that. And the committee is made up, this is vital, the both central office district members across the board, again, whether they're asset management, like Dave Solzru will be following me, he's on the committee. Uh, people, people like me, materials engineers, planners, uh, district personnel, et cetera. And we plan on giving demonstrations to the industry this spring. Obviously, again, they were driving force behind this legislation and they are very interested in how we're doing that. Next slide. Can't give a presentation without pushing our National Rural Research Alliance. This is a little dated. We're officially up to 80 associate members now. It's been way more successful than I ever thought it would be. Uh, we've got several states. I think we're up to 10 states. We're gonna be at the upcoming transportation conference. Hope you can make it 17th, 18th, and 19th. And uh, should be should be an excellent conference. We've got somewhere like 13 different tracks and uh, hopefully we'll get the river center packed and we'll have a good time. We've got 88 vendors, we've got equipment, et cetera. Uh, hopefully you, you can sign up for that event. Next slide, please. Any questions? Okay, I got one more slide is my thank you slide. We're multimodal at MnDOT, I happen to collect these old bikes. It's a bike that I wish I had when I was a kid, but now I can actually afford it. So thank you very much. All right, I don't know, Rachel, is that my cue? My cue to get started here? I think so, Dave, it's all you. All right, how's our time looking? We still have, a, it's 3.30 now. Um, I know you're gonna talk and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So I think we're doing all right. All right, I still got 10, 15 minutes to go through this. Okay, well. Thanks everyone for uh, hanging out this long, I guess. We're transitioning from pretty theoretical to pretty tangible, practical uh, implementations of some of these things. And we're talking about tools here. Um, what I'm talking about is probably gonna be more uh, um, application of various types of tools in cultural change, or sometimes I call it cultural advancement. And so I wanna talk about our, our preventive maintenance activities. Uh, Glenn, you know, likes to say when we, uh, you know, I wonder if is my screen sharing? I don't think I managed that, did I? I'll try that again. It's not sharing right now, Dave. All right, let me try. I think I must have to, one more button I'm not used to. Are you seeing the uh, yep, little slide? There it is. All right. Okay. Uh, Glenn likes to talk about you know in our, our current um, our current stage of operations here when we build stuff we got to be thinking more about the tails and you know what's the long term implications of um, you know the pavements we put down for example and we saw some really wonderful ways of looking at the um, <clears throat> looking at the life cycle treatments and being able to predict the future uh, but a lot of it depends on how well we take care of it in the in the intermediate term and we talk a lot at MnDOT about preventive maintenance uh, I, I want to show you about some of the um, 
challenges we've had really getting uh, practicing what we preach, so to speak, and um, how we think we've kind of turned a corner on that. So, so with regard to tools, um, I'm kind of a believer in the, you know, in this sort of systematic uh, systems um, approach to, you know, to making these major changes. Um, MnDOT's a big organization, over 5,000 people. There's a lot of decision makers. And so I think we're, you know, we're real of the belief that you have to really operate on a lot of the different components of these various systems. So you might know about Transportation Asset Management Plan, TAMP, required by federal legislation back in 2013. Um, MnDOT's been producing a TAMP for a couple, a couple of versions, and at our, our first official <clears throat> TAMP presentation, one of the things we did is a, a pretty broad outreach with our district folks uh, who are, you know, in large part the decision makers on how the money gets spent and what gets done to these assets in the field, um, held quite, a, quite an uh, aggressive training workshop, and a number of concerns came out of the, you know, the attendees there. One was our ability to follow through on our on our beliefs on preventive maintenance, and so that, in combination with four or five other major topics, led us to create what we call an asset management strategic implementation plan. <clears throat> Might sound kind of funny having strategic and implementation in the same title, uh, but we really were focused not only on setting a course for the future, but also getting it done. So, as part of that plan, one of these major topics was we're calling it life cycle strategy action plan. Uh, Glenn led a team that we use to try and develop some ad more advanced processes to, uh, you know, to address it. it really means our preventive maintenance, uh, our PM needs. So some of the challenges <clears throat> that we face and part of the reason that we did have to take such an aggressive stance to do the uh, preventive maintenance implica uh, implementation. Um, you know, maybe smaller agencies, more centralized agencies might just be able to declare this, <laughs> this is our policy, uh, but life seems to be more complicated than that. And the few things that we face uh, in MnDOT are the decentralized decision-making processes. Um, you see highlighted in yellow, in yellow here in our organizational structure are the district engineers and the district decision-making um, really where that's housed. Uh, we've got the expert offices like Glenn's and Materials and Road Research, which is under a completely different uh, area of the organization. And then we've got the planning, which, um, you know, kind of determines how much money will go out to, to the districts based on recommendations from, you know, from these expert offices. Um, you know, their, their closest common denominator is the, con the commissioner. So the structure, um, you know, necessarily, obviously, for the... Um, different expertise that, you know, that we have to maintain, uh, but it doesn't lend itself real well to, uh, you know, to streamline implementation. So programming allocations, right? I mentioned that with regard to the, you know, the programmers. Um, and then we've got this whole competing set of objectives. Um, you don't need to read the, uh, you know, the text around the, uh, around the circle diagram here, but payment condition is a major portion of it. Uh, but then we have all these other competing interests and in it in the districts we we budget projects like glenn talked about selecting projects but when it comes down to do the preventive maintenance on uh, the sort of ongoing smaller investments that really competes with all the other needs that you know that districts have uh, in a lot of cases um, even emergency needs so um, you know we face a situation where preventive maintenance really really struggled to compete well with some of those more urgent urgent needs so also we have a number of different ways of delivering projects some of it we do with our uh, our maintenance forces some of it we do by capital projects and then there's some uh, we call them indefinite uh quantity indefinite delivery indefinite quantity uh contract they're kind of work order contracts right so you put some money in a checkbook and then you have a contractor and you you write checks until you do the work until the money is gone uh, we really struggled over the years to have a good way of, uh, of capturing. We need to capture all those means of doing work together. So 
a uh, few additional barriers. I talked about the emergency needs for the, that sometimes interfere with our use of the preventive maintenance. Uh, also cultural, you know, it's, um, you know, the whole, the whole agency is a lot of ways focused on delivering major projects. Um, it's, it's real tough, <clears throat> I think, sometimes to, um, you know, to sustain the importance of these sort of smaller ongoing, ongoing fixes. Um, purchasing power revenue is declining over the, over the future. Um, we have payment measures in place uh, until recently, the ones that Glenn showed really kind of short term and, and ride focused, not so much about long term. Um, you know, the, the sort of measures that doing preventive maintenance work really supports. And then, of course, our maintenance culture too. there, you know, those folks, understandably, are focused on addressing emergencies. And uh, so there's a, a bit of a culture uh, change that needs needed to happen there too. So, so I talked about the, the team that Glenn led uh, through the AMSIP project, again, um, trying to develop processes, structures that will support the, you know, the outcomes we want. Um, in, in uh, uh, you know, by comparison to some of the existing structures. So very collaborative. I think the tool there is, is really bringing folks together, decision makers, all the folks on the left side there are really uh, district folks. Uh, so we really, we tried hard to build collaboration and buy-in into the whole process. So number of solutions considered, we did acknowledge that sometimes the money for preventive maintenance is legitimately used for, for other high urgency needs. Uh, we did consider adding you know, some additional pots of money, if you want to call it that, set-asides. Um, that makes financial management even more complicated. Um, considered the idea of more centrally managing some of the work. Ultimately, we landed on a, um, a performance measure approach similar to some of the measures that Glenn showed in the capital program development, uh, looking at the age of the pavements and what we really aspire to do in terms of, you know, these BM treatments like crack filling and, uh, and thin surface treatments. And that was, you know, that was what the, what, the, um, what the stakeholders wanted. They want the flexibility to be able to uh, manage the needs, the competing needs um, within their, you know, within their budgets. So, so we're getting to the end here. Um, basically some the, the, uh, the tools we are essentially landing on to improve our, our performance, uh, really having the measures uh, set of measures, you can sort of maybe see them on the right hand side here, for example, crack sealing by the time of pavement, any pavement uh, more or less is five years old, we should have sealed the cracks. Uh, by the time we're seven years old, we should have had a, a thin surface treatment uh, placed on that. So we've got these, uh, these measures and tracking capabilities now to be able to show where the work was done against the, what the targets are. Uh, and then uh, process wise, I say better planning and programming here. One of the objectives of the process is to, instead of rely so much on our set aside, really build preventive maintenance projects into the STIP, the longer term financial plans. So we know the roads that we have paved in, in the past and when that window of opportunity is going to close basically. And so we can, we can lay those plans out uh, for when that work needs to be done and, and build those into the, uh, into the financial the financial plans. So uh, a little bit more about process. Glenn and I just finished meeting with each of the districts talking about their preventive maintenance outcomes for last year, as well as plans going uh, forward into the future. So that again, to me is a kind of a process tool, this sort of cyclical uh, check-in uh, conversation relative to, you know, relative to the program. Incidentally, we have as part of the, uh, that strategic plan, another whole committee structure that was set to um, um, advance communications, asset management communications in general. And that's been a pretty aggressive, uh, aggressive process across the districts as well. So, we, you know, we're also able to, you know, speak to the, you know, the preventive uh, measures and um, 
interests in uh, managing the payments. So, and the last thing I gave, uh, I quickly listed the three uh, methods of delivery of preventive maintenance and then tracking systems. So we've had the payment management application around for quite a while that captures our capital programs. Uh, we've recently implemented this transportation asset management system. It does a very good job of capturing where and when and how much it costs for our maintenance forces to do some of this work. And then we used our capital highway uh, investment management system to uh, develop some processes to account for uh, the work done under that IDIQ process that I that I described. And so we finally have a, a robust means of capturing all the work that gets done. And then that allows us finally to uh, use these GIS and mapping tools, spatial analysis, and so on to uh, to be able to evaluate our work against the, against the performance measures and the needs of the system out there. So smattering of topics, but uh, as I said, you know, when we think about um, some of the fairly substantive cultural changes that need to happen across a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of interests. Uh, it really, to me, merits bringing all these factors together in that sort of systems approach. And so I think, I think Glenn would agree where we feel like we finally turned a corner uh, in terms of our, you know, our uh, capabilities and, and ability to deliver on the, the preventive needs of the, of the payments at this point. So that is as much as I wanted to say, you guys. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for the presentation, Dave, Glenn, Jennifer, and Mihai. Um, we're now going to transition to the Q and A session. Beth, did you want to check to see if we have any questions? I think there's a couple in the the sure. chat. Sure, we have one question going back to Mihai's first presentation, and the question was from Chris Dedine. What's the thickness of the medium mill versus the thick mill um, in your example that you were talking about? Hello, Chris. He was a former student, and uh, I was his advisor. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he did some excellent work on recycled asphalt materials many years ago. In terms of uh, the values, I, to be honest, I do not know the specific value. I would imagine, you know, that the thicker one would be four or five inches, maybe. Uh, the reason we had two thicknesses was uh, uh, the following. We used the, the medium size to, to fix asphalt pavements when we did the calculations and we used the the thicker one for concrete pavements. And this was uh, due to uh, the fact that uh, uh, the examples that the, the uh, Washington State Department of Transportation in their examples, they had a very large cost of fixing Portland cement concrete pavements. So they had like 2.5 million and that kind of uh, made the analysis not uh, quite fair and so that's why we talked to, to Dave Janish. I remember the discussion and he suggested we use one type of overlay to be more of a balanced approach for asphalt and the thicker one for concrete. So but I don't know the specific uh, uh, thicknesses, but probably we can, I can find it out and send it to you, Chris. Thank you, Mihai. It's two to four. Oh. Yeah. This. And, and we, I think one reason Jennifer can chime in on is we pick that because it's a very common fix. We do that more than any other fix right now. So, yeah, yeah, that's correct. I'll say anything over 4.5 is thick and 2.5 to 4.5 is medium. Got the thumbs up from Glenn. Thank you guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the other comment that we have um, already listed in the Q&A, but if you, if you have any other questions as we're uh, moving through this one, please go ahead and add it to the Q&A, or you can raise your hand and we'll let you ask the question verbally. So this question is from City of Chanhassen. Eric Hendrickson is asking a very logical city question. Will these degradation models include other indices, for example? As a city, we focus on the payment condition index and not so much on the RQI. 
And in a follow up to that, will the native models be made available for smaller municipalities to input their own unique data rather than what was used for MnDOT, like perhaps the city road thickness, volume, speeds? Um, they're different, obviously, than what MnDOT would typically encounter and could produce different degradation results. I think that's probably a Jennifer question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, the methodology would be the same. Um, so we selected right quality index. Um, that was the one that worked best for us. But yeah, the, the, the same method could be used for uh, BCI or any other metric. And the same thing for the site-specific features, uh, thickness and speed limits and volumes that all is related to what data is available. I, can I add something uh, sure. based on what I've seen? I think our analysis, I think, uh, fits better, a more complex, very large network. I, to be honest, for a city network, I don't think that they, they could apply, but I, I probably I would use something more, you know, something simpler, <laughs> more straightforward. Uh, analysis. I, I think this kind of a, a very complex Markov type of analysis for a CD would probably be too much if you ask me. So I would go with very simple look. The important thing is to have historical data and look at the trends and see how that works. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Jennifer and Mihai. We don't have any other questions in the Q&A. So is anyone um, got one that they'd like to share? I guess I had a quick question for you guys. Um, you had kind of talked about computing the asset sustainability ratio. And I was just kind of curious, do you include crack ceiling when you kind of sum up your annual life extension? That is a really good question, Christy. We, we obviously should, but we don't. It's, it's hard to say how much value you're adding with crack sealing. We all, we all know you do. And Frank, it's the same with chip sealing too. So currently we, we don't add that, oh. but, we, but it, it makes sense. So, our, so you could say our, our model, our, our outcome for, for asset sustainability ratio would be conservative. So we really are extending life with that, but maybe that's something Jennifer can figure out in their free time. Then maybe I had another one just to add to that. As you know, we certainly notice as our system gets older, um, our treatments don't tend to last as long. Do you somehow incorporate that into that valuation as well? Uh, yeah, we do. We found that, especially with our overlay program, you start off, it, it's, it's gradually deteriorating over time. And again, that's going to vary from section to section. It's hard to, to say, well, that's, that's across all of our network, whether it's asphalt or concrete. But yeah, we have noticed that. And we, we try to, that's why we're creating this software to allow the user to input for their special needs, because different districts are in different subgrades. For instance, District 3 is a lot of it's on an Oka sand plain, a lot of sand there, where you get up, you know, in Duluth with the red clays are nasty, District 2 up in Bemidji area, a lot of bad clays, District 8 that Dave's very familiar with. They've got some really good farming soils, but not so good for roads. So we, we want to, eventually we'd like to, right, you know, we have, we're going to have standards. We're going to have basic curves. And Jennifer, again, just sent an email to me today when she's finished off the deterioration curves for various fixed types. But, but that's a starting point. It really is, because it's, it's, it's going to vary, as you well know. Does that answer your question at all, Christy? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Anyone have any other questions? We still have lots of people on the line. Feel free to raise your hand or type your question in the Q&A.
We do have a follow up question um, to add to that local question. This is from Chris to Dean. The city of Minneapolis also uses PCI and not RQI. We've got 1200 miles of street in our network. I would love to see a local implementation of this work, maybe as an LRRB study. And as me, I noted, that's that's a great idea. Um, something we can submit to that group for sure. Or maybe yeah, someone I, I on the call as part of that. Not that we'll oversell the pie too much, but I would think something like that would be valuable if you've got your system and you want to play with your fixed types. Uh, and then, like I always say, hit the button and see how it turns out. I, I think something like that could be a value. Now we're like, obviously we haven't implemented it yet and you need to have the base data. You need to have the deterioration curves. There's a lot of stuff you need to have before it's valuable, but I, I would think it would, it would help. Does MINDA currently use the PCI to help in selection of treatment types or programs or anything? Uh, basically, we're, we're our, our QI. Okay. We, we have our SR ratings, which we use for concrete fixes mainly, but we're pretty ride driven. But, but again, we are, I see Tom Mead from District 6 on the line. We, we, our job is to help the districts with our software and our expertise to make these decisions. They, they take they take the fixed types that we recommend on a yearly basis and they look at them and then they, they go out and, and actually look at the roads and maybe take cores, et cetera, maybe some radar for thickness. So that it's a starting point really is what it is for us. Mm -hmm. We have Jill Scott asking if uh, we were able to share the presentations, and I, I'm guessing that's something we can easily do. CTS could help us share these with the group. Good question. Yeah, I'll be sure to let Gina know. She had to kind of hop off the call here, so I'll be sure to let her know that it was requested to have the presentations, and I think she'll be the one to send sort of a follow-up. Great. Thanks. Any other questions out there? So if not, we can transition to the round robin. Um, I think um, we'll put the questions in the chat as well, but um, I guess we're looking to see if any of the participants wanna share some information or if you have any ideas on um, future presentations you'd like us to plan for these meetings. We tend to have a meeting um, in the fall and then one in the spring. And then we do have some joint meetings throughout the year. Or do you have any transportation issues related to infrastructure that you're dealing with right now that you wanna share with the group? Um, and then just any organizational updates that you are interested in sharing, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Otherwise, um, if you put it in the chat, we can read it to the group. I know pavement's a hot topic at Hennepin, so it's, I always like to hear what other people are doing. And I, I really like some of that info, Glenn, that you had shared on kind of looking at condition and incorporating um, VMT. I think that was, that was interesting. Um, we did get a question. Are any other jurisdictions using cartograph scenario builder? I feel like that's the program a lot of different agencies use. The county does not, but I feel like I, uh, Maple Grove might use that, um, maybe Carver County. Looks like Minneapolis is using paver. Um, 
All right. Any of other last minute thoughts or comments from anybody today? Shan Hassan is using Cartograph and has dabbled in Scenario Builder. Okay. Make a connection there maybe to compare notes. Well, great. Um, thanks so much for attending this afternoon. I know we finally got the sun out here in Minnesota, so everybody's probably anxious to get outside. <laughs> and thanks so much to Mihai and Jennifer, Glenn and Dave for um, presenting and sharing your expertise with the group. Take care. Thanks, Christy. Thank you, CTS. Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Goodbye.